I'm Tom Buffano. I'm the director of the Photonics here, Center here at Boston University. I'd like to uh, welcome you all to, uh, to this town meeting uh, to discuss the National Photonics Initiative, the National Photonics Institute. I'm, um, I'm very excited to have you all here. Um, the, to uh, offer some welcoming remarks is the uh, Dean of the College of Engineering, Dean Luchin, and uh, I, I'd like to introduce him now to have him give a few words of welcome. Thank you so much. I got I to clap so that I didn't say a word yet. <laughs> <laughs> welcome, everybody. Uh, to a, what I think is going to be a pretty exciting uh, uh, meeting to discuss uh, whether, not whether, but how uh, photonics and optics can have a transformative impact on society. Uh, my job is really to welcome you all to Boston University and to give you a perspective. And as I thought about my remarks, I think it's kind of remarkable that we're actually here at Boston University with the leading thinkers and drivers of photonics and optics and how they impact society uh, sitting here. Uh, and I say that because, as many of you uh, know, but many of you may not know, uh, 20 years ago, uh, there, was, there was no photonic center here at Boston University. In fact, there were no PhDs in any engineering discipline until 1992. And yet, we sit here 20 years later uh, with a, one of the top-ranked colleges of engineering in, with a, an extraordinarily well-regarded, uh, impactful photonic center. And uh, the, I think at this point, we are 20th in the country in research dollars per faculty member. We were uh, zero in 1992. That's a remarkably fast rise for any college of engineering. Um, bringing in now about $80 million, if you include all in, in engineering uh, per year uh, to Boston University. Now, my, I was thinking about this, and I said, how did this happen? Well, I think it happened in a couple of ways. First, we focused on critical interdisciplinary engineering science areas. Things like photonics and optics, as, as is evidenced by the Photonic Center. Things like uh, materials. Things like bioengineering and information systems. And by the way, all those areas are inherently interdisciplinary in, in their own, on their own. Secondly, we had a, uh, a drive to recruit a balanced, a set of balanced portfolio of faculty uh, in, uh, to Boston University in engineering. With a, when I say balanced portfolio, I mean basic scientists, applied scientists, and translational scientists. We understood that as a college of engineering, even though universities by their definition are the, the fundamental mission is to advance the forefronts of knowledge, an engineering school should have as its mission to take, take that knowledge and translate it, or at least spawn the translation of ideas which can impact society, because engineers make stuff. And uh, the third thing is that we emphasize the need uh, for faculty to work on not just interesting problems, not just difficult problems, but important problems, and problems that can really impact society's grand challenges. And that made for a very rich environment here uh, at Boston University. Now, the program today is really exciting uh, because it really addresses not simply innovations that could be spawned by photonics and optics, but whether and how photonics and optics uh, can be, uh, and manufacturing, uh, can all be synthesized so that eventually these new, dis these new innovations can be distributed to impact the public. Now, uh, clearly, optics and photonics uh, enables many uh, challenges and technologies that can impact, impact society, and from the healthcare point of view, from city function point of view, uh, from defense, from sustainability, and so forth. But the nation also needs to re-energize uh, its innovative approaches to being able to manufacture products and to regain its capacity to continue to innovate these product lines along the way. The last part is what we've recognized recently uh, has been uh, outsourced in ways that are um, not a, for a, a, a country which has made its, made its point by being the leaders of innovation. So we need to bring back the capacity to innovate new product ideas and then innovate product creation for society. So BU is very excited, and I'm very excited about this day's program for a couple of reasons. First, uh, a major challenge for all of these future applications uh, will be the manufacturing innovations needed. And where will that workforce come from? And if I, as I go around the country hearing about the advanced manufacturing uh, uh, institutes and initiatives and other institutes and initiatives, a big question is, a, a big emphasis is on the research interactions with the public-private partnerships. But 
What I don't hear a lot of talk about is where the workforce will come from. And at BU, we're creating, as you know, in about uh, two weeks, a shovel goes in the ground to create the Engineering Product Innovation Center, a facility, 20,000 square foot facility, to introduce all engineering students, regardless of background, to the, tech, the fundamental technologies of going from a software design or a product design to fabricating that uh, potential product from a 3D printing <coughs> and robotics and, ma and materials characterization to the issues of, su of, uh, of supply chain management and, uh, and um, inventory control so that all students are aware of the technologies associated from an idea to a product. Uh, second, our photonic center has incredible scientists and facilities to spawn uh, the next generation of scientists and ideas to create how photonics will impact society and transform the way we live. So again, I congratulate you on putting this great uh, day together, this great discussion together, and I wish you luck in just creating some incredibly creative and exciting ideas about how photonics and optics are going to transform society. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ken. Um, I'd like to introduce the, uh, the uh, Chief Executive Officer of the Optical Society of America. That's Liz Rogan. Uh, Liz has 30 years experience in corporate, federal, and nonprofit work. Uh, she's done uh, some stints as uh, JFK Center for, at JFK Center for Performing Arts and then went to become the Chief Operating Officer of OSA. And, uh, and eventually became the, uh, the CEO of OSA. She has a BA from, we, you know, at the university, we like to know where people came from academically. She has a BA from UConn, so that's nearby. We like that. And, uh, and an, uh, an MBA from the Wharton School at Penn. So uh, we're delighted to have her here. OSA, as you uh, may or may not know, has taken a, a keen leadership role in trying to figure out uh, what's the future for photonics and this, uh, this grand uh, national initiative in photonics. And so I'd like to welcome Liz Rogan. Uh, good morning. Thanks for being here. Um, when I was at uh, Washington National, I was, um, they, they kept on changing the, uh, the gate where the flight was leaving from. This is typical of this, um, of airports. So we finally get on the plane and somebody wants to be clear about where they're going and the staff yell out, um, Boston, capital of Red Sox nation. And um, so you'll be proud to know that US Airways does have some fans of the Red Sox. Um, thank you, Dean Luchin. We couldn't agree with you more in terms of what you just um, stated up here about the importance of optics and photonics. And uh, Tom Bufano, thank you for hosting us today. You know, we're very excited to be here. Um, so the National Academies has um, helped support this report on optics and photonics called Essential Technologies of Our Nation. And it was written by the Harnessing Light Committee. And we have two of our uh, members of the Harnessing Light Committee, uh, Ed White and Tom Baer, who helped write the report. And um, Larry Goldberg from the National Science Foundation, who was the main uh, lead funder for the report and got lots of other um, ac academies and institutions to help fund, along with OSA and some other groups. And then Steve Fantone, who's a member of our board and also runs a leading uh, optics company here in Boston. So we're very happy to have different aspects of experience to talk with you today. And I see um, a number of OSA members, so thank you so much for being here. So I wanted to talk a little bit about OSA and then move on to the report itself. Um, part of what we do um, is we work with our staff and our volunteers to talk about the, to a non-technical audience about the importance of optics and photonics. And that's what um, that's what you, just, you were just able to do, and that's what um, on the Boston University website, you do an excellent job on your videos and your promotions about displaying to these non-technical audiences the importance of the work that you do. Um, I was looking at the National Gas Leaks piece that you have, and of course optics is involved with that, and it was, just, it was visually easy to understand, and um, it really struck me as um, one of the many things that this university does here is importance. You've got, um, you've got four uh, honored 
members of your group from the, uh, that just won awards for the National Academy of Inventors. And again, that's taking research and actually applying it to real world problems. So um, we talk about that and it's, because it's an enabling technology, it is difficult to make that connection between what you do and how it impacts the general public. So um, that's part of what OSA's job is as well. Um, like a lot of professional societies, um, you are probably members of more than one if you are a member of a professional society. We run um, a host of programs, and up here on the screen is just a, a snapshot of one uh, of the many um, activities that we have, um, both aside from the fact that we're a membership organization, we're a publisher. We publish the most information on optics and photonics in the world. We've got 15 peer-reviewed high-impact journals, and um, that's part of what our service uh, supplies. We also run conferences and meetings all over the globe. So we probably serve about 20,000 um, uh, researchers and engineers and industry people on an annual basis. We have corporate programs, so there's a number of you from industry here today. And um, providing information about issues um, that you're challenged with and having network opportunities to meet your colleagues is something that we think is important for us to provide. Public policy, which is one of the reasons we're here, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. We, of course, it's important to award your professional um, colleagues. And we also run a foundation that does a tremendous amount of outreach for our future generations of leaders. So as I said, we're uh, located in Washington, D.C. We have 18,000 members that are located all over the globe. And um, they're made up of industry, engineers, scientists, students, teachers, and um, more than uh, half of our members are outside the U.S. We actually have about 700 members here in the Massachusetts area, which is one of the top states. So you're top in a lot of things, and now you know you're top on OSA's membership ranks, too. In the corporate member area, as I said, Boston the, is, is amazing in terms of we have about 250 corporate members. 10% are right from this area. And um, so you can see uh, up here on the um, screen, from anywhere from uh, biomedical devices to telecom components, there is a nice portfolio of groups that are represented. And um, you can see uh, IP. G Photonics, Opticos, uh, Lincoln Labs, there's a number that are right here locally. So on a public policy front, it's important in terms of what you do here um, as, a, as a university in terms of your connection. So I was looking at the, um, you do a great job at writing about science and you're writing about what happens in Washington. So there, you're a member of this Science Works for us.org and you've just written a really wonderful piece about what's happening in Washington and trying to make the case that what you do enables jobs, enables technology um, transformation and is part of the whole economic growth. So you, you've already been involved with that. OSA does that as well and we do it in a variety of different ways but we all know with this upcoming sequester, March 1st is how many days away? Who's counting, right? But you know the sweeping changes of this sort of, without having a really strong opinion about the way it's being a, approached. But um, the AAAS um, estimates 54 billion dollars over the next five years could be cut out of our research and um, uh, academic budgets. That's um, really going to hurt on many, many different levels. So. One of the things we do is we organize a couple days where, where people like you come in and talk to your congressional leaders. You can do that here locally, but it makes a difference to, I think we had 45 visits last year, and our, your reps need to hear from you. They need to know what your story is. They have so many other special interests. I mean, it's hard to believe that, that science and, and technology shouldn't be number one or number two on their list, but there's so many other sophisticated special interests that get ahead of the funding needs of what we think is important. So you have to uh, visit your Congress people and educate them on what you do and the importance of what you do. Um, so we have an event this year uh, on March 2nd, March 12th and 13th, 
and I welcome you to come uh, to Washington to be part of this very well-organized and well-trained um, program. And here are uh, different um, uh, people that we've met through the process. Another thing we do is we applaud anyone who's in the a public office throughout the world that helps with optics and photonics. So we have this advocacy of optics recognition. And um, no one else was doing this for a very, very long time in recognizing individuals who just helped on a policy basis to spread the word about the importance of, of this. So uh, some of the people you see here, recent award winners, are Neely Crows and Antonia Tijani who work for the European Union, and they got photonics in their key enabling um, technology uh, uh, language in their budget. We also awarded Steve Conroy, who many of you have probably heard about in Australia, the whole idea of providing an, um, an internet connection for 93% of the, of the population there is amazing, and how that's gonna transform the country. Um, past awards, uh, Rush Holt, one of the few uh, PhD phys physicists on the Hill, and uh, former rep Gabby Giffords of Arizona for the work that she did in solar energy. And just two weeks ago, we um, awarded our Nobel Prize winner and honorary member uh, Steve Chu uh, from the Secretary of Energy, also won for his work that he's uh, done in recognizing optics. So, um, of course, the reason we're here today is to focus on a public policy issue, and that's the National Academy study. And um, the report is an update from a report that was done in the 90s, and um, we've had a number of events. We're talking to people like you. You, know, you do know what the importance of optics and photonics is, but now we really have to take advantage of the fact that this report has been updated, and we have some key challenges that uh, your dean has just referred to. So the focus for the report had five areas that you can see up here, um, including uh, communication and broadband challenges, advanced manufacturing, uh, defense, health, and energy. So those are the areas that you'll hear about next. Thank you very much. Thank you, Liz. Um, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Tom Baer. Tom Baer is a, a, a member of the, uh, the NCR Harnessing Light 2 Committee, which came up with this Essential Technologies Report. Um, uh, Professor Baer is the, um, the executive director of the Stanford Photonics Research Center. I was thinking I should be called executive director now. I, you know, I've just been director, but I think from now on I'm going to be the executive director of the Photonics Center. <laughs> Overlord. <laughs> He's also co-founder of Arcturus Bioscience. He has a BA from Lawrence University. Who knows what state that's in? Uh, All right. Wisconsin, right? Wisconsin, is that right? Yeah. And, uh, and a PhD from the University of Chicago. He's a fellow of the AAAS and of OSA. And, uh, and he is leading the charge for uh, the National Photonics Initiative yeah, among all the people here. So we're very delighted to have him here uh, to give you a perspective on the report and why the report was done and what its key findings are. So I'd like to introduce Tom. Just a second, let me launch the other uh, presentation. Uh, by the way, uh, it is St. Lawrence that's uh, in Kansas, so it's close, but uh, Lawrence University is in Appleton, Wisconsin. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here today, and I want to thank all of you for coming to uh, help us launch uh, both the National Academy Report and the National Photonics Initiative, which I think are two major events for our discipline. You know, I've been in this field for uh, several decades, and this is actually the first time I've been to Boston University. It's a very impressive facility, as uh, Liz mentioned, and certainly the, the work that comes out of here is something that the world follows and uh, I think represents some of the best work in our field. Um, it's the first time I've been here. Uh, I, of course, am from the left coast, and if any of you are interested, I'd be glad to host you to visit us at the home of the world champion 
San Francisco Giants. Uh, I just had to get that in there. Uh, and um, uh, as, as mentioned, I'm the executive director of the Stanford Photonics Research Center, which is a complement to this center here. Uh, at Stanford, we have about 50 faculty that are members of the centers across about uh, 12 different departments in the three different professional schools and about 250 to 300 students that, and postdocs and researchers that are also part of, the, part of the center. So comparable to what you have here, we have a very well-established uh, photonics community. And it's very important for these communities to step forward now to help us communicate to our representatives and to the public at large the impact that photonics is going to have uh, in this century. In my view, we are really well poised. We've got a tremendous story that we can tell. And uh, I think photonics is to the 21st century what electronics has been to the 20th century, that we are going to have a tremendous impact on the future of, uh, of technology and its impact in our society, as well as U.S. competitiveness. And that's what really what this uh, study was all about, was trying to capture that across a wide range of different uh, areas of impact. And uh, I think it, it, it succeeded in doing that in, in about four or 500 pages worth of text. And part of what we're trying to do with the National uh, Photonics Initiative is to present that in a way that's easily digestible both to our representatives as well as to the public at large. So this was a report that was about two years in, in the making and was released uh, about six months ago. It was supported by a number of uh, familiar funding agencies here and uh, a, a number of the scientific societies that are active in, in the areas of optics and photonics. Again, I want to stress how, what a key role Larry Goldberg from NSF played in leading this. It was one of the NSF was one of the major funders of this, and he was certainly the major proponent uh, within NSF supporting this study and then f the follow-up uh, uh, activities, uh, the National Photonics Initiative. Uh, this is the second report. It, the charge for the community, uh, for the committee, was to uh, basically update what was published in the first Harnessing Light One study back in 1998. And one of the mistakes we made back then is we published this and then we didn't do anything with it. Now we were one of the only areas of technology development in the world that didn't do something with it. They worked very hard in Europe to consolidate. Uh, resources and focus them in the areas of photonics and I think you know particularly in Germany uh, you've seen uh, the results of that Fraunhofer Institute's worked and created a remarkable industrial laser uh, commercial presence there I think in Japan in Asia they also recognize the importance of what we were stating in this harnessing light study I would, participated in that one as well as a consultant and I think uh, one of the major reasons why we're doing the National Photonics Initiative is we realize that we've got to take these studies and really do some good marketing associated with them, explaining it in easily digestible ways uh, uh, to, the, again, our, our representatives and to the public at large. So part of the, 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 the task statements are indicated here. And this is a U.S.-centric study uh, we, because it's sponsored by the NRC and by NSF. The real focus is what can we do in the U.S. to increase our competitiveness, bring jobs into the U.S., and, and in, enhance our national security. So the way this was done was to pull together a, 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 a summary of optics and photonics and then try to distill that down into a series of grand challenges, which could be easily summarized and, uh, and highlighted. So this was a, uh, this is the, the, the committee. As mentioned, there's about 16 of us. And there was an emphasis to try to capture, as opposed to the first report, to capture the, the ec economic uh, impact. And so there were four people that were really focusing on the economy and another four or so people uh, that uh, really represented the industry input. And you'll notice I include myself in the industry side because I really view more that is my pedigree than uh, an academic uh, uh, pedigree. Um, you know, this was nice to have this group. You'll notice that also that there, the majority of the contributors here are from academia. And I think in some ways that was a mistake. If you take a look at other studies that have been done that were really inspired by High Harnessing Light like One, they're primarily industry driven. And I think this day and age, that's really a key, is to bring forward 
uh, the people who are really trying to do the translation process and commercialize the technology, because that's really what sells right now. It's jobs, economic security, competitiveness, and again, Homeland Security, the things, those are the hot buttons. It's not that we don't care about basic research and funding basic research. In fact, that's one of the primary goals of this is to justify this funding. But right now, uh, the best way to do that is to emphasize the extent to which we're gonna improve people's lives and, uh, and cost effectiveness in healthcare, et cetera, and really stress those aspects of, of what photonics and, and optics can do and then bootstrap that to funding of basic research. I think this is going to, it's not trying to reapportion the pie, it's make the pie bigger for everybody. And I think this is the most effective way to do it. So the study itself had about 10 chapters associated with it, and, and they're listed here. And uh, again, it was, as you can see, there's 323 pages and then about 150 pages of appendices. So it's a, it's a long and, and detailed study. There are some summaries of it that were, uh, have been published, several actually have been published by OSA, SPIE, and then by the National Academy itself. And these are the, uh, the uh, uh, websites where you can download these, uh, these summaries. And I, I do recommend you start there if you're interested in reading the report uh, because they're a little bit more digestible and they, they do summarize the grand challenges. So the, the, the second chapter is one of the critical chapters, and really it, it starts out by sort of a general survey or general picture of the impact of photonics on the national econ economy. And one of the first charts they show is this one, which is actually something that I developed with, uh, with uh, Fred Schlachter for LaserFest. And it shows the impact of laser technology in three major sectors of our economy and shows how the core technology is uh, in the inner rings here, which define roughly you know, about $50 billion worth of economic impact, but it really it leverages uh, uh, on the order of a five to $10 trillion worth of economic activity in the US. And this is part of what we're trying to do, is show how optics and photonics is so integrated into our infrastructure that uh, it is a critical part of, of really almost 50% uh, of uh, the U.S. economy. And this is, it will be discussed in more detail by members of the committee here, or this panel here, in particular Ed White. But again, in transportation, the lasers basically touch every car, every train, every airplane that's made today and make them lighter, more efficient, and uh, more competitive. Uh, just uh, the number of parts that are now machined, laser machined and welded in an automobile are in the hundreds. So it plays a critical role in, in, in our manufacturing infrastructure and this is a message that we need to convey. It also is, is of course, a part, uh, the major uh, technology component of our, uh, the information and telecommunications network and it is integrally involved in the manufacture of uh, almost every major component in a computer and a cell phone. And these are the sorts of things that we need to communicate directly to, uh, to the general public to make them aware that optics photonics is an industry by itself that has some key uh, elements that invade uh, all, all major areas of our manufacturing technology today. So here are some examples of grand challenges. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, but one of the major ones was a, 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 a development essentially of a photonic in integrated circuit foundry or foundries throughout the U.S. And this is something that has been recognized by the OSTP as a major investment area, a major potential investment area for the United States. And this is really integrating electronics and photonics into, uh, in, into packages that are consistent with their deployment in data centers, in telecommunication and sensing and other areas. And it's an area of development where the U.S. has traditionally been one of the leading areas and we need to maintain that. We're certainly getting a lot of uh, competition from China in this area. Another grand challenge that was, uh, was talked about was looking at, at how we're going to be able to improve the bandwidth uh, of the, the internet. Uh, it, it is predicted that in about three or four years, we're just going to run out of bandwidth. And uh, YouTube is, uh, downloads are going to, you know, uh, take longer. Uh, the other four billion people in the, in the world that uh, want to download YouTube videos are, are, are going to overload our capacity as they, they come online for being able to service the sorts of bandwidth needs 
that are, are currently accepted as, as, as a, a normal uh, operational performance for, uh, for the Internet. Uh, how we're going to move from WDM and get this next factor of 10 or so uh, uh, increase in Internet bandwidth, how we're going to be able to do that in an energy efficient way because it takes a tremendous amount of our electrical grid power structure now to be able to power the Internet as ex exists today. And if we m improve that uh, bandwidth by a factor 10, how are we going to support the energy cost of, the, uh, uh, of our optical network? These are, stated, uh, these are technologies that don't exist today that it's going to be up to us uh, to develop over the next five to ten years. Um, of course, uh, the whole energy of, the whole area of energy uh, that Steve Chu has, uh, has really pioneered for us and led uh, the country over the last four years so effectively. The goal that was identified here was to try, uh, reach cost parity. Uh, with uh, solar power uh, as compared to fos fossil fuel power uh, by the year 2020. And if you talk to Steve, he's optimistic that we currently have the technology to do that. It's more of a, a deployment and then improvement so that we can actually re reduce uh, the, uh, the cost of the solar energy below the fossil fuel uh, costs over the next three to five years. Positioning the U.S. as a leader of the global data center is not only a business opportunity, but it's also important for, uh, for homeland security. We want the data centers to be located here in the U.S., and to do that, we need to be the leader as far as the photonic integrated circuit technology as being able to build the core rack-to-rack uh, uh, -rack and blade-to-blade -blade communication technologies that have the bandwidth and, more importantly, almost, the energy efficiency necessary to uh, be able to operate these huge data centers. These data centers now not only have hundreds of thousands of computer cores in them, but they have millions of lasers, literally million, a million lasers in these data centers uh, uh, transferring information between the blades between, and between the racks that hold those blades. So the laser technology is there primarily because of energy consumption, and it's developing this and moving this forward that is going to be a critical part of the U.S. continuing as the leader in the data center business. And again, it's not just business. It's really we don't want these data centers to be located in China. We, do, you know, we don't want them outside the U.S. And to do that, we're going to need to be uh, the leader in developing the, uh, the, uh, the technology that is the basis for them. And then in the biomedical area, the drug development process has not accelerated. It is, in spite of all the advances in quantitative biology and, and quantitative medicine, uh, coming up with ways that we can use measurement technologies based on photonics to be able to accelerate the drug development process would reduce healthcare costs and improve safety and efficacy of new drugs as they're being developed. So these are some of the highlights and the recommendations. So what we want to do here in the National Photonics Initiative is really the sequel to this report. What we're, what we're trying to do here is, is continue forward with and really uh, preach the recommendations that were presented and the grand challenges that were presented and to provide a little bit more texture and detail to those grand challenges. We want to bring together input from industry, academia, academia and government and to uh, provide uh, the, the expertise that we need to really define what are the technological barriers that are preventing us from achieving some of these grand challenges. Uh, and then to help coordinate across the federal government the spending that is occurring right now and, if possible, increase that spending and focusing it in areas of photonics. But if not that, then let's at least get coherence between the different funding agencies so that we can look at those critical areas and perhaps uh, coordinate that funding to bring to more to a critical mass level the funding necessary for breakthroughs in these, these different uh, uh, technology needs. And then finally, there's a real need, I think, to better uh, develop uh, industry academia interfaces. Uh, the, the examples uh, uh, that I've seen traveling around the world as OSA president was that there are countries that just do this better than we do. And the company, countries like Germany with the Fraunhofer Institutes, China, uh, Korea, uh, Taiwan, Taiwan, the government has just put in place uh, incentives for universities and, and industry to work together that seem to be better than what we have here in the U.S. And I think there are some existence there and some programs in the DOE which can be emulated. So I don't think we're creating things from scratch. 
but we do need to come up with, I think, better ways to incentivize that sort of interface. We have the best educational system in the world, and I think the best technology base and best free market system in the world. We just got to get these two things interfacing better, and I think we will uh, improve our competitiveness and, and be able to really grow in this particular area. So as uh, Liz mentioned, we highlighted in the National Photonics Initiative uh, five areas, energy, information, technology, and telecom, biomedicine, advanced manufacturing, uh, and homeland security are the areas that we decided were the greatest economic impact areas in the report, and we decided to focus on those particular areas. What we've done is we've gotten together the five major societies that are involved with photonics, IEEE, OSA, SPIE, um, LIA, and APS. And they're working together like we did in LaserFest, and which I think was a, a very successful coordinated effort by these societies to uh, educate. And we've brought uh, the together industry, academia, uh, academia, and government agency people and organize them into subcommittees representing those five areas. There's about, oh, 20, 10 to 20 people on each of these subcommittees. They've been meeting uh, by, mainly by teleconference uh, over the last uh, month and have put together a list of priority recommendations. In this particular case, we've tried to get a dominant industry input at, uh, to this uh, to compensate for some of the lack of that in the report. The idea is to write a draft paper that will be a, a white paper and put together a PowerPoint presentation, which will be presented uh, ultimately to OSTP and the Committee on Science and Technology, and uh, basically presented uh, through, uh, through the government funding agencies. Uh, next week, we're going to have a meeting at the National Academy headquarters, uh, which will be a uh, uh, really the official launch of the, the report but we'll also involve these subcommittees meeting with government funding agencies where we want to solicit input from those agencies to get their input as well. And then assemble a final draft of this white paper, which we hope will be available to, uh, to everybody in our community, as well as uh, the, again, the OSTP and the Committee on Science and Technologies. So that, that's the plan, and I welcome your input and comment. Uh, this is supposed to be a town hall, and so I'd like to start to open this up to uh, question and answers. Uh, uh, Q&A session, both at the end of this presentation as well as um, as we start to launch into the uh, uh, the panel discussion. But to close, uh, you know that was that's the short-term plan that should get us through March into April, uh, which I think is good timing uh, for what as we as this administration launches its second term. I think we're coming in at the right time with this suggestion for initi initiative. Some of the longer term goals are to establish this infra an ongoing infrastructure for continual industry academic input on strategic investments and road mapping. The electronics uh, uh, area does this well. They have an ongoing road mapping activity that actually is involves thousands of people across the world. It's the ITRS, and they publish every two years a, a road map which illustrates where the uh, electronic, uh, microelectronics technology is going. And I think we need to do the same in photonics. So that's one of the long-term goals. And then the other is to establish government programs that really uh, uh, increase this collaboration interface, as I mentioned, between industry and academia. And uh, I think these are, would be legitimate long-term goals that if we're successful in, we'll, we'll, we'll change our industry uh, uh, much to the better. So with that, I, I think I will close. I can open it up for any questions now, uh, if there are any. And then we can also move on to, uh, uh, to have the panel discussion begin as well. So with that, I will close. Yeah. Oh, I'm also supposed to mention that if you have questions, please wait for the microphones, because they are recording uh, this, and they'd like to make sure that your question gets uh, appropriately recorded. Well, then, if there are no questions right now, oh, do we have? OK. Uh, well, then, let me introduce uh, Ed White uh, from uh, Ed White Consulting. Uh, and Ed was a, uh, a very productive member of the uh, National Academy Committee and uh, has a, a very extensive background in optics in uh, a variety of manufacturing roles within industry uh, in the Rochester area. So Ed. 
<clears throat> Good morning. Um, as uh, Tom said, my name is uh, Ed White, um, and from Rochester, New York, uh, the home of the Rochester Institute of Optics at the University of Rochester, and the home of Abby Wambach, who is coming home to play uh, uh, soccer. So as we were talking about sports and <laughs> Red Sox and, and so on. Um, I, I, I retired from uh, Eastman Kodak Company uh, about five years ago, and when I was at Eastman Kodak Company, had responsibility for um, their uh, optics organization, so from um, R&D uh, through design, through commercialization, through manufacturing um, around the world. And it was a great experience, and um, I, I did that for uh, better than half of my career um, at, uh, at Eastman Kodak Company. Um, I left Eastman Kodak Company, retired from Eastman Kodak, and uh, have started a consulting practice um, at White Consulting. Um, real novel name. But it was... Um, <laughs> It was a privilege, um, you know, working on the uh, the study, uh, Harnessing Light 2, um, working you know, with uh, contributors who are giants, uh, really, in their field uh, of optics and photonics and collaborating on the issues and challenges uh, that exist uh, in this field. Um, and I will have to say that I felt, um, those of you who are uh, Big Bang um, um, fans, I felt a little bit like Howard on the Big Bang, all these heavily credentialed people and uh, my lowly masters. Um, um, I had the opportunity to uh, lead the advanced manufacturing chapter. And uh, you, to lead this chapter and to work in this chapter, you really have to be a believer in U.S. manufacturing and the fact that we can participate in U.S. manufacturing. And the folks that worked on this um, uh, part of the study um, were real believers that uh, uh, manufacturing in the U.S. Uh, could be uh, and, and, and should be viable. Um, I was thrilled to hear the dean uh, talk about the new initiative here at um, you know, Boston University that are going to give engineers experience from design through de development, through commercialization, through manufacturing, and understand all aspects um, of that chain. Those engineers will be particularly valuable to the industry when they graduate. And I think one of probably the, um, one of the bigger gaps we have today are engineers that are interested in pursuing careers in manufacturing um, and looking for novel, new and novel ways to produce optics and photonics. And I think with what's going to be done here at the, um, the Photonics Institute, Boston University, I think that that's, um, it's definitely very encouraging. Um, over the past decade and a half, um, what the study had indicated that manufacturing has kind of slowly moved, um, or maybe not so slowly, moved offshore. And in the study, we highlight three um, areas of um, technology that's moved um, you know, offshore, uh, displays, solar cells, and optoelectronics. And this uh, migration offshore had largely been driven by um, cost mature products going, over, uh, going offshore for cost. Although consider man considerable manufacturing has moved offshore, I'm convinced that the U.S. can participate um, in manufacturing, in advanced manufacturing, in photonics and optics. I'm absolutely convinced of this. And over the same time frame that technology or, or manufacturing has moved offshore, technology has been improving um, in the U.S. Um, the ability to make complicated optical systems, complicated photonics devices um, that never could be, be, before be made reliably and consistently are now able to be produced um, in the U.S. by um, companies that um, have been successful and have maybe been born out of some of the larger research and development organizations um, uh, in, the, in the country. Um, I believe that the U.S. can be an important player um, in optics and photonics, and um, I believe that we need to have participation between industry and industry at the lead, academia, and, and the government. And Tom's talked about that a bit, you know, with the, the Fraunhofer approach. We hear a fair amount about the Fraunhofer approach. It's been very successful um, in Europe, in Germany, and I think it... Um, an approach very similar to that in the U.S. Um, could uh, pay dividends. Um, the products I think that we can produce successfully in the U.S. Um, are products that um, fall into a category of 
you know, novel, new, um, high, ultra high precision, products that are early in their life cycle, um, products that perhaps are lower to mid volume, and products clearly that are defense related and uh, ITAR or export controlled. Um, now, that doesn't mean that we should give up on consumer retail uh, products, um, but quite honestly, products that um, compete on tenths of a cent, um, it's a little bit difficult for us to um, have those products um, at home. Although, again, I'm all in favor of looking for ways to, to, uh, to do those uh, products here. Um, I was really thrilled uh, to uh, hear the pr President Obama talk in his State of the Union just recently um, about the um, support of the Advanced Manufacturing Initiative in the U.S. Um, it was very close to the ver beginning of his State of the Union indicating the importance that you know, this administration is putting on advanced manufacturing and the growth of jobs in the U.S. His um, comment was that um, he is, was announcing the formation of three more advanced manufacturing institutes to be formed this year. The first one of those advanced manufacturing institutes, by the way, which he set aside a billion dollars to fund, was formed last year in additive manufacturing in Youngstown, Ohio. Um, now three more institutes are teed up. Nobody knows what those institutes are going to be, but there's no reason that those institutes, one of those institutes, should not be a institute on advanced manufacturing for optics and photonics. Um, and, and I, I know that uh, all of us on the, uh, the study committee uh, believe that to be true, and my guess is that um, there are many people in this room that believe that to be true as well. So I'm going to you know, kind of close and hand it off back to, uh, to Tom, but I would say that um, I'm a believer that manufacturing can be done in the U.S. We have the capability. Um, we've demonstrated over the years that um, we can be novel with inventions, and um, um, I look forward to kind of help driving this uh, National Photonics Initiative forward and hopefully a institute in um, advanced manufacturing photonics and optics. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. So let me introduce uh, Steve Fantone. I think uh, Liz briefly introduced him before. Steve, of course, is an icon in the photonics uh, industry here, both in the Boston area. He's on a number of boards uh, uh, worldwide in photonics companies and also has been the longtime treasurer and one of the major leaders and, uh, uh, within the optical society. So Steve. Thank you, Tom. Um, I'm hoping to bring a Massachusetts perspective to uh, the opportunity that is in front of us here. Uh, it may be hard for us to recognize this because we're really immersed in it, is that Massachusetts is in a really unique position to benefit from uh, an initiative like this. We see a lot in the news today about the quality of public schools. The public schools in Massachusetts are number one in the country today. If Massachusetts were, uh, you hear a lot about international uh, competitiveness. When they do the international rankings of public schools, while the uh, United States may not compare favorably, Massachusetts ranks number seven in the world if Massachusetts were a separate country. If you look at our educational system, higher educational system here, uh, this is a environment which is often imitated and rarely duplicated. That within five or 10 miles of here, you have many of the top 20 institutions in the country. Uh, earlier this week, you may have uh, seen on the news Mayor Menino and Elizabeth Warren talking about the effects of sequestration and the fact that 10% of all NIH funding is performed in eastern Massachusetts. And uh, that is something that is uh, just not duplicated anywhere else in the United States with this density. The corporations that we have in eastern Massachusetts or in Massachusetts in general are really uh, leaders. and. You know, one question to ask is, how did this really happen? How is it that when you look at uh, uh, the largest employer in Massachusetts, 
It's a manufacturing company. It's Raytheon. Where did Raytheon come from? It came from Tufts University. It came from MIT. It came from Vannevar Bush. And Vannevar Bush's impact is still being felt today in the strong <coughs> governmental funding of basic research and translational work to move that basic research into uh, real uh, products. And then finally, the, the culture that we have here in Massachusetts. You know, we we'll all find ourselves here in, in Boston. There's a reason why we're here, is, you know, uh, around the country, if you talk to governors and mayors uh, uh, around, the, around, around the United States and even around the world, you'll find that they would love to be able to synthesize this environment, and it's a, really a very rare uh, environment to have. Uh, the density, uh, the cooperation, uh, the opportunity that we uniquely have here uh, nationally, I think, is, is, is quite remarkable. And it would be a, a shame for us not to look at the opportunity that's being presented. It is a good thing for the country and it, it would be a great thing for Massachusetts. So, thank you, Tom. Next, I'd like to hear from uh, Larry Goldberg. And uh, Larry is, I'm not sure I'm gonna get your title right, Program Director? No. <laughs> Senior Engineering Sen Advisor. Oh, there we go, in the Engineering Directorate. Directorate of the National Science Foundation. Okay, so Larry, as I mentioned, it was really one of the prime movers behind this whole initiative and the, and the study, so Larry. Thank you, Tom, and uh, welcome to all of you. I'm so pleased to see such a large representation from industry. Uh, uh, I think you'll uh, find that the efforts of this study uh, really uh, can benefit uh, growth of the optics and photonics industry, as Tom and other members of the panel have already pointed out. And I'd like to thank them also for the uh, exceptional work they have done in developing this study and, more important, in the dissemination efforts that we are now engaged in. The um, first discussion of uh, having this harnessing light to uh, study by the National Academies uh, started some time ago. As far back as 2008, we had meetings at the Advisory Committee of the International <coughs> Commission of Optics in Washington uh, talking about the possibilities of, of doing a study. And a number of the uh, agency representatives, myself at NSF and uh, professional societies that were involved, uh, OSA, SPIE, IEEE, notably, uh, decided that this was really time uh, to uh, go forward. So we began putting together agency participation uh, to uh, develop the requisite uh, budget that would be required by a National Academy study. And finally, that was begun in 2010 and the report just came out this past August. Now we are at that critical juncture of getting the word out broadly and benefiting from it. At the NSF, there is considerable interest within the agency in using this study as a basis for developing a strong uh, funding activity in the optics and photonics area that will be part of our 2015 budget presentation. As a result, the uh, directorates of engineering and of the math and physical sciences uh, have formed a working group. I'm co-chair on the working group representing engineering. My co-chair colleague is Charles Ying from the Division of uh, Materials Research in the Math and Physical Sciences Directorate. We have participation by program officers from across the foundation where there is activity in optics. So we have representation from all of engineering divisions, uh, all of the math physical sciences divisions, which is physics, chemistry, math, astronomy. Uh, we have biosciences directorate, the computer information science and engineering directorate, 
social and economic sciences director and our international office of science and engineering. So we have a strong cohesive effort at the NSF to put together now a roadmap for our plans to move forward with efforts in this area. We feel that we're at an important juncture in what is a dynamic and evolving era of breakthrough discoveries and technological innovation in this field. But increasingly, some of the most profound work, as mentioned, uh, has been occurring overseas, and that many of our leading talent from universities, faculty and student graduates, are being attracted overseas to positions there. We have to work to counter that movement. And so developing this uh, partnership among academe, industry, and government, I think is an essential aspect of that. One of the uh, views that we have at the NSF is that we need to invest in an education and workforce workforce development for an increasing internationally competitive environment. And we have to prepare the students with entrepreneurial schools, skills uh, and the experience of working internationally and in collaborations uh, so that they can better uh, perform in this era that we're seeing. We are also concerned about small business uh, investment as you know, the NSF, like other federal agencies, has programs in small business innovation research, SBIR. We have also a program in STTR, which is called Small Business Technology Transfer Programs, which requires involvement of <coughs> university faculty uh, together with uh, small business companies. As a result of our current activities, there will be now a special STTR solicitation focusing on optics and photonics uh, for the next year. And we have also introduced the category optical and photonic, optics and photonics into our descriptive literature for our small business innovation research program. So we encourage those of you in such companies that are eligible to really look to NSF and to other agencies uh, to provide your best ideas. We are trying to coordinate, as uh, mentioned, uh, with other uh, federal agencies. Uh, we will have this meeting in February 28th at the National Academies, uh, and it'll give us an opportunity to um, network together uh, with the intent of really building this area uh, into a strong national activity. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. So at this point, we can open the floor for questions from the audience, if there are some. Well, I can, yeah, please. Uh, there have been a number of references made to the Fraunhofer model of Germany, which I happen to know a bit about. Uh, the main reason why Fraunhofer in <coughs> Germany has been so successful is because it gets permanent and perpetual funding. Not a fixed amount, but a fixed percentage, uh, namely 33% of budget. 30%. So there is an incentive to do well and succeed and serve industry, so you get more work, so you get more base funding. Mm -hmm. All these initiatives that we're hearing about lately coming out of the government and the Obama administration, like the NMMI, uh, Manufacturing Institutes, uh, they, they all have term funding, you know, five years. We all know what happens to government-funded projects, uh, programs when funding runs out. So my question is, are we really gonna have a long-term impact with term-funded programs? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, you're absolutely right. Tom and I happened to be in you know, Germany a couple of years ago, and we talking to the folks from the Fraunhofer Institute and um, um, uh, some of the folks in, in government. And you're, and you're absolutely right that they they get a um, 
kind of a, a third, well, 33% of their funding comes from, from the government. Um, I think that the, what we have in front of us right now with this uh, uh, advanced manufacturing initiative from the Obama administration is an opportunity to kickstart, to jumpstart uh, advanced manufacturing. I think what they're saying is that they, don't, they do not want to be at the lead for um, going you know, forever, perpetually. And there needs to be a sustainability model um, that gets developed by um, this, uh, by, by industry um, um, in particular. So, you know, I think the impetus is on industry to kind of look at this and say, what can we do to make this a collaboration of government, academia, and industry, ramp government funding from 100% down to 33%, as an example, of which there, there potentially could be ongoing funding. I mean, um, you know, that type of thing. If you look at, you know, we met with OSRAM, you know, over in Germany. I mean, they're a perfect example of industry taking the lead, driving white light LED technology with the Fraunhofer's, and they were, they were the big funders. So I think that um, uh, this kind of, uh, you know, evergreen model where uh, industry is kicking in at least their share of the 33 percent is something that needs to happen and we can't look for government to be the 100 percent funder uh, perpetually. You know, it's an interesting perspective that you bring uh, because when we were over in Germany talking to the uh, several heads of the front office, they stressed the opposite. They said that one of the advantages of the front office is that they were sunsetted, mm -hmm. is that if they couldn't get the industry support, they would go away. Right. And so they, the, the potential for perpetual funding is there, but they stress that what was most powerful was the fact that the Fraunhofer's became obsolete. And, and they cited a couple of them that have. They did, um, yeah. That so were I think it depends on your perspective as to what are the important features. Regardless, I think we need a new model. And I think on that, we, we certainly, uh, I think all of us agree. Go ahead, please. I just kind of wanted Andre to introduce himself. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, in addition to being a professor here in mechanical engineering, I actually run the oldest Fraunhofer Center in the United States. Mm -hmm. So that's okay. why I know a little bit about Fraunhofer. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. And I agree with you. I think we're saying the same thing, yeah. though. The yeah, reason yeah. that, however, mm -hmm. it, the, the reason that it's important to continue to have industry support for the Fraunhofer Institutes, and they're saying, it, it goes back to what I said. The, the funding is perpetual, but it is not a fixed amount, which yeah. would let them become complacent. Uh, you know, it's very different from the national lab models, well, not agree. to imply that they're complacent. But mm -hmm. if these institutes don't go out and generate industrial funding, their base funding goes down because it's a percentage of budget. But right. I just wanted to respond to your point, which, yeah, it would be great to have industry pick up the, the funding after government funding runs out. But history teaches us that when government funding goes away, so does industrial. Uh, funding. So it's and and in Germany, it is the government that takes the lead, and that's what's been so successful. So I always find it interesting to be hearing for the last couple of years now all these references to the Fraunhofer model being such a good model. But the unique feature there is that the government is taking the lead in providing that base funding perpetually. So I think until we come up with an alternative model, if it's not going to be the government, it's going to be really tough to keep these institutes going. You know, I, very honestly, I wouldn't sell the front offer model that way, uh, that it's perpetual funding by the government, because mm -hmm. uh, I, I, that, that it works well within this community. It's nice to have that security. But I, at this point, I don't think that's the message that's going to resonate with, on, on uh, Capitol Hill. Uh, I think what resonates is, uh, what's going to resonate is uh, this joint collaboration, the identification of goals and research uh, focus that's really going to meet U.S. competitiveness, U.S. needs, and it's going to evolve with those needs. And I think that's the spin we're going to take. But I'm certainly open to other, uh, other approaches towards selling this idea. Steve, I'm wondering if you could comment at all on what, what you know, a small company like Opticos, would a, a participation in a Fraunhofer-like activity or STTRs, or what, what, what appeals to the, the small company CEO uh, as a potential collaborative effort going forward? I think first, it's access. 
generally uh, for small companies to interact with universities and research institutions, it, it initially is a financial transaction. Uh, m many times universities are looking for corporate partners in part to uh, be able to pr provide base funding for graduate students and research programs and most small companies can't do that. So we uh, look to uh, gain access to students, professors, consulting time, sometimes instrumentation and, and build relationships whereby we can uh, help them leverage the technologies they have in their labs and turn them into products or turn them into other business opportunities while at the same time having access to tools that uh, we simply can't afford to have. And I think that's, that's really a missed opportunity today. Okay. I have a question. So um, I, I have some experience with the NSF centers. And when you talk about starting a center, like a Fraunhofer example, where you have 100% government funding and then it tapers off, that reminds me of the NSF Center program. Uh, so I, was, I would ask Larry maybe to comment on, on why, I mean, obviously some centers in the NSF centers stay alive and they do, they're supposed to get um, you know, private funding to continue on after 10 years. Um, but you know, mine <coughs> went, you know, went away. Uh, or at least it will next year. So it seems like we're, we're starting, or we've tried that model that you, you suggest. But I was just curious if, if you guys had some comments on, on those thoughts. But, uh, before you do, Larry, I was just going to comment that the, um, the additive manufacturing uh, uh, center in Youngstown is, is not 100% funded um, by the government, and um, uh, it's uh, actually almost 50-50. Uh, I think it's a $70 million initiative, and I think it's um, 37 to $40 million by the government and the balance by, by industry. So um, I, I, mis I may have misled you to say when I said it was 100%. Um, may I first ask which center you're involved in? <laughs> I, I was involved in the EUV Center for Extreme Ultraviolet Science and Technology, okay. which was trying to uh, advance uh, short wavelength light right. to do various applications. So I'm very familiar with that. One of the engineering research centers. Uh, let me say NSF has a variety of center programs. The Engineering Research Center, one of the longest such programs. Uh, we have science and technology centers. We have materials research, science and engineering centers, physics frontier centers, and I'm sure many others that uh, uh, are in other fields. The uh, NSF uh, policy as determined by our National Science Board, which oversees our, our uh, foundation, uh, requires that a 10-year lifetime of any center at which point there must be recompetition, open recompetition. And so we sunset such centers, uh, typically fund them down in the last year or two, uh, and impress on them the need if they wish to retain sustainability, that they begin to uh, develop other sources of, of uh, support, industry or whatever, uh, to at least keep the core aspects of their uh, centers going. And some do this effectively, and others uh, uh, transition to perhaps university-based centers or institutes or other activities. Uh, this uh, is a model which has worked effectively. Uh, it keeps new ideas going. Uh, it uh, enables also many of you to uh, look for what are opportunities that have grown out of the investments you've made in the uh, uh, center you've been involved in. Let me mention there are other aspects in which industry can play a role. In the Engineering Research Center, there's a strong requirement actually for industry membership, and they have an opportunity to uh, uh, have advisory uh, role in center activities, uh, mentoring role for students, <clears throat> and probably <clears throat> most importantly, uh, often they have access to the students uh, f after their graduation 
who will go to these companies as employees. There is another type of activity that NSF uh, encourages uh, with the acronym GOLI, Grant Opportunities for Academic Liaison with Industry. You and academe can submit a proposal to NSF, uh, which has a strong industry partnership. The NSF monies will not support the industry, but the students who are supported under this partnership could spend a year or more within the industrial environment working together uh, with the uh, industry um, research team. And so it builds a strong coupling that eventually will benefit the industry by um, access to students. Uh, so there are many such act, uh, aspects. Let me come to one other uh, thing that goes back to this National Photonic Initiative concept. How to uh, involve industry cooperation with federal investments in research. NSF is an example. We interact closely on many levels with the Semiconductor Research Corporation, which is a consortia of industry members in the semiconductor field. Over two decades, we've had uh, cooperation in which we have carried out joint funding solicitations in topic areas of joint interest, and money has come from that consortia to uh, some degree to match NSF's investment. Most recently, we had an activity uh, in the nanotechnology area, one of the signature initiatives, which perhaps you're aware of. This is nanoelectronics for 2020 and beyond. In 2010, we held a solicitation in which the NSF put in 18 million from several directorates, engineering, math, physical science, computer, and so forth. And the industry consortia put in two million. And we funded uh, a large number of interdisciplinary projects for a four-year term. The benefit to the industry that they had was their members could be, uh, have liaison with the academic teams. They would uh, come for a review process and give their feedback to the university. They would mentor students, and most importantly, they had access to students. So that's one example. I'm hoping that this more diverse optics community of industries can find some way to cooperate in a consortia-like activity, not necessarily only with funds, but with your involvement in some of these uh, funding efforts that agencies like NSF uh, can uh, put out for the uh, community. Mm -hmm. so, so let me just ask a, a more general question. Um, in the lighting industry, of course, we've got new luminaires and we also have retrofits. So it's great that we're doing these new initiatives and it sounds like we're doing it very intelligently. We also need to make sure as we are lobbying that we think about the existing rules and the existing programs as you've described to make sure they're doing what we want them <coughs> to be doing. When we talk about stimulating or helping small businesses, we've got some wonderful programs. And for example, the GSA has beautiful set-asides and has beautiful lists for small businesses. And those are terrific and they're terrific people administering it. The question I have is why with LED technology, representatives of the major lighting manufacturers are grandfathered to be on that list. Why do we need that? Of course, when there are only five manufacturers that can make a light bulb, in order to have anyone on that small business list, you need to have the representatives of those five listed. But with LED technology, we don't. We could have just simply small businesses that are manufacturing lamps on that list. Similarly, um, small businesses are defined as less than 500 employees. Is that what we want it to be if we're going to stimulate new businesses? Another example that we can consider is for SBIRs, which is a terrific program well administered, 
but for companies in California and companies in Massachusetts, we have a high standard of competition because there's so many applying. There may not be any fair way around that nationally, but it's something to consider as we look at the existing programs and make sure that we're providing the kind of government help to small businesses that we expect. Well, I, th I think this is exactly the sort of input we'd like to get as we go forward and define more specifically what the recommendations would be for different types of uh, government policies that could be put in place to help uh, uh, spur innovation at all levels, all sizes. And I don't know, Liz, if you want to comment a little bit on what people in the audience could do going forward uh, to help uh, us deliver the message through the, some of the activities in the OSA and other societies. Sure. Um, I first wanted to introduce uh, two staff people who are here from OSA, Ann Matsura, who is one of our um, science advisors. Ann, if you would stand. And Laura Colton, who is our director of our government relations activities. <laughs> and um, what we do on a public policy um, approach is we make sure that there are opportunities for you to connect with Congress. And we try to make that as easy as possible in terms of whether it's template letters or uh, um, uh, giving you information on who to contact, on giving you uh, updates. We have a legislative um, update that goes to about a 1,000 of our members on a regular basis that keeps you uh, informed about how to go about communicating these great ideas and suggestions that you have. Um, and uh, again, that's um, one of the um, purposes of the organization. I would add to that, don't expect the societies to deliver the message for you. They will give you the opportunity to deliver the message yourself. They represent both big companies and small companies, and so they will take a neutral position on a lot of these, uh, these subjects because they do have a heterogeneous membership but they provide tremendous opportunities for you to sit down with your representatives, with uh, people on the Committee on Science and Technology who really make these decisions. It's one of the most impactful things that you can do as a member of a scientific society is to participate in the Congressional Visits Day because they're very well organized and you talk exactly to the people, not necessarily to the representatives, but almost more importantly to their science policy advisors and you educate them on exactly what you're trying to, to do and it is a very effective way. To, uh, to have some impact. Hi, uh, I, I have to ask a question too. So my question is, uh, uh, we have an industry university collaborative research center here at BU, and, and I'm, I'm thrilled at the emphasis on industry here. But, uh, but at, a, at a basic level, it seems to me that the NSF should really be concerned with science and technology uh, uh, and, and the invention and discovery of new science and new engineering technology. And so when I look at your report, mm -hmm. there's, uh, um, there's a choice to be made. One choice, for example, would be to, uh, to promote uh, better fiber optics for better communication. You can't argue about the, uh, the importance of that economically. But there's a real question in my mind about whether that will come from new science or just from better industry, better industry uh, uh, innovation or manufacturing. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you have something like neurophotonics or optogenetics where there's a whole new field uh, invented in the area of photonics. So how do you decide at NSF? about which of these things are more important for NSF to promote? I know this is a tough question, but, you know, there you are. <laughs> Let me uh, first comment that uh, this field, uh, optical science and engineering, as it used to be called in optics and photonics, it's inherently multidisciplinary. And it's the interaction across disciplines that really will lead to new ideas, sometimes in uh, not realized areas. So we have to keep that in mind. So yes, the NSF does invest in uh, science and engineering at the fundamental level. But if you look at our directorate of engineering, uh, we value innovation in ideas, and we value the translation of those ideas 
into economic growth. So we have a foot in both fields. And if you've listened to many of the programs from our uh, new, our recent director, re soon to be recent director, <laughs> Dr. Uh, Subra Suresh, who's from MIT, again from this area, uh, he has put an exceptional effort into uh, those ideas of innovation and translation through many of the programs that uh, he has been fostering, including international collaborations. So all of that is important. You know, one of the assumptions, uh, I think, in sort of having this dichotomy, as you presented, is that somehow being uh, industry directed or industry problem solving directed, you don't end up doing good science. And I fundamentally feel that that's just wrong. Uh, there is a tremendous opportunity to good, do good science as you explore the boundary of what's possible within commercial application and in, in industrial manufacturing. And often it illustrates most uh, clearly the boundary between what we know and what we don't know and don't understand. So personally in my career, that, that's how I've directed a lot of my scientific inquiry and have resulted in doing some very good science and solving extremely practical problems within the, our area of, uh, of optics and photonics. And, uh, you know, so I, I, I tend to think, and this is, I try to assuage my, or convince my colleagues at Stanford that really this is an opportunity to do really good science uh, by I employing your, or deploying your efforts in, in response to some of the industry needs. There was another question? Yes. Um, yeah. uh, excuse me. I mean, okay. one of the things yeah. we might want to also say is that um, um, on the study, um, and we contemplated the National Photonics Initiative, one of the things that we thought about were there might be these technologies that um, may not be able to be funded solely by industry. And if the National Photonics Initiative were to be able to help direct and guide some of the funders in terms of technologies that need a longer run of investment, you know, that's one of the roles that the, the, in, the initiative could play. Um, I have two questions for Larry. Um, you, you said that you're at NSF you're developing um, a strong funding area in optics and photonics, and I wondered if you could say a bit more about what you mean by strong funding area. What type of funding are you thinking of? So is it, would it be small grants or center grant type funding? And then the second part is, as you develop the NSF roadmap, is there any opportunity for the community to provide any input? on that? Well, we are currently, as I mentioned, engaged in developing a roadmap, first of the inventory of what NSF is currently supporting across the many parts of the foundation, and then making recommendations to our senior management for areas of future investment that could be part of our budget submission. Uh, the focus is on optics and photonics as broadly supported, but it could be a biophotonics, could <coughs> be manufacturing innovation, could be uh, photonic platforms, could be a whole variety of, of areas. Uh, these uh, eventually, we hope, will lead to funding initiatives. This is our hope, I can't say more than our hope, uh, that would be uh, interdisciplinary, that would cover some of the major areas of uh, opportunity that have been defined, and um, the input of the community through efforts such as uh, the um, group here and uh, future meetings, and we'll, we will be doing workshops in areas that we identify as possible opportunities for initiatives before we go ahead with such. Uh, and their community input will be certainly be critical in that. But it's in the planning. <laughs> if you have time for one or two more questions, yeah, go ahead. Um, I have a question, uh, touches on funding and also going back also to the global competition issue. I read an article a couple months ago about uh, China and what they are doing. With, it's, I think they called it uh, government-funded or government-sponsored 
capitalism where the government builds the facility and then turns it over to industry. And I was wondering if anybody here knew more about that and wanted to bring us all up to date on that. I don't know that much about it. It was a short article. Well, in, in my travels to China, I interacted with SunTech, which is a good example of a photonics company that was primarily initially supported by government. In China, one, one of the interesting things is uh, the, the industry support is not necessarily federal. And that happens here in the U.S., particularly in New York, I believe, a good example of uh, state-sponsored uh, industry development. In China, in this case, in SunTech, there was a significant investment made by the uh, local government uh, in the province where SunTech is located. Basically, they get the facilities built and then rent-free for you know a, a several years a, as a part of the support that's provided. So it's not so much a federal program like we're proposing here, it, but it is really uh, uh, the the government infiltrates the private sector in ways that we just don't see in the United States. And I'm not don't know that is necessarily a good thing, but because uh, I think you, you've seen the impact that that has. Some things don't die, uh, and uh, some of the industries don't uh, recycle, and there isn't the creative destruction that you see in a normal capitalist society. So I think that explains some of the differences. You know, the words industrial policy are dirty words in the belt, within the Beltway, and that's one of the things that we're going to have to deal with, is that we are suggesting uh, that there be a more cohesive and, uh, and uh, interactive government policy with industry. Not picking winners and losers is one of the, the goals uh, of, uh, uh, or one of the mantras that go on w within the government as well. But there are examples of programs that I think work. There's a Department of Energy program, which is called the Bay Area Photo <coughs> Photovoltaic Consortium. And in this case, they have a panel of industry people basically all industry people who put out the RFQs and they define what they would like academia to work on. The proposals come in, then there is a mixed group that evaluates the proposals, including the industry reps, and they choose the to fund those efforts. It's a $15 million initiative by DOE, which I think captures a lot of what we're trying to do with this NPI. And it's an existence theorem for something new we can try and encourage DOE to expand. It's these sorts of uh, ideas and input from you people out he here as what, what's going to work for small companies and large companies that, that we would like to bring in as input as we put together and fill out what we should do as a part of this National Photonics Initiative. I don't know if anybody else wants to comment. Yeah. I, I was just going to say that uh, my experience in, uh, in China in particular that the government is more inclined to give uh, incentives relative to taxes and um, you know tax holidays. Um, um, there is kind of a real estate incentive that they do, as you had indicated, where they might um, uh, fabricate a building and then provide some uh, rent-free assistance, that type of thing. But in most cases, it's employment-based. I mean, so um, if you bring a lot of employment to a region, um, you're more inclined to get um, um, you know help in that regard. We have time, just one or two more questions. And yeah, I had a question. Does uh, how does these initiatives that you're describing here uh, relate to the national laboratories? I haven't haven't heard anything <laughs> about them. And there certainly is an awful lot of optics and photonics research done there, and there's an awful lot of money tied up there. <laughs> and so I was wondering. I haven't heard anything at all about the national laboratories. It's a very good question. Uh, we have uh, representatives from the national laboratories uh, on, uh, on these committees, and we are uh, encouraging them to participate in the February 28th event. I think the national laboratories, to a large extent, are redefining their, their purpose in life right now. I think a great example of a lab that's done that well was under Steve Chu at Lawrence Berkeley Labs. And I think they transformed themselves into a real leader in the area of innovation uh, in renewable energy under Steve's leadership. I think that's a process that's going on in parallel with the National Photonics Initiative. And it has to do with redefining how the government interfaces with industry. <clears throat> I don't think we, I, I, I certainly don't have an answer, and I don't think we've generated one within the NPI. So you're pointing out something which still is a work in progress. And again, we solicit, we're soliciting input from the government labs. Some of them are open to this. Some of them want to do just what they've been continuing to do for the last okay, 50 we'll years. 
And, and I don't think that's in the cards. So I, th I think there is, again, an existence theorem at Lawrence Berkeley Labs of a lab that's really done that, done that very well, redefined what their uh, purpose in life is. I think having them as a part of the NPI would be great, but we haven't defined what that role is going to be. I don't know if anybody else wants to. We probably time for uh, one more question, and then I think uh, we're at 11.30. You want to? Yeah, uh, a big part of this initiative uh, is to try and find ways of building, you know, growth, both economic and research-wise. Could you comment a little bit on how, I guess, the research money should be divvied up between basic and applied research to sustain uh, growth economically mm -hmm. across these two? Larry, do you want to? <laughs> There are uh, many agencies in terms of government uh, level support that are involved in optics, photonics field, uh, uh, defense, energy, NIST, uh, and NIH. And uh, to some extent, their interests are very defined, mission oriented, would be more development level. Uh, they would be the more appropriate. Uh, supporters of uh, such research. But I don't think there is a, a defined uh, uh, split uh, to be suggested between the two. The MRS uh, just did a study in which they really stressed a specific point, which was that we've done a really effective job of rationalizing investments in basic research within this country. What we haven't done is really explain the importance of translational activities of taking that research and innovating uh, the knowledge and science base into technology. We, we just haven't done a good job of selling that. So as I mentioned in the, my introductory remarks, that's really what the NPI is about. And the, it's not that we're not valuing or want to reduce in any way the amount of funding for basic research. In fact, it's quite the opposite. We want to, we want to increase that. We feel the right message to send right now is, is that uh, the translational activities that are ongoing and that can be better focused and perhaps increased in expenditure, not at the expense of basic research, but where we can increase investment, that that is a key element which will then allow us to create this feedback loop which will provide more funding back to basic science, which is, you know, personally one of my major goals is to make that happen. Right now, as I said, I think the major message that we want to give is we can improve the economy, we can increase jobs, we can increase homeland security and U.S. competitiveness by this National Photonics Initiative. It's not at the expense of basic research, but it's really trying to close the loop to justify expanding the investments in basic research, but it's not the emphasis right now. So I think we're at 11. Uh, go ahead. One, one go quick ahead. comment. I, I think there's an analogy here with what's been going on with Centers for Translational Medicine, mm -hmm. yeah. in which there's you know a lot going on in the research labs and the medicine, but you know where do I see that when I go to my physician? And trying to move things out of the research labs into, in, in the case of medicine, to real services that impact healthcare, you know, is is there an analogy to be applied in the photonics area into products and, and ultimately jobs. And again, here in Massachusetts, uh, you know, if you look at, the, there's been a number of impulses over the years. Uh, World War II funded radar, radar funded a whole series of companies around Boston. Many of them are still in existence today. It funded reconnaissance that led to BU's Optic Center. It led to formation of iTech. It, now it's, it's basically funding Goodrich, which is now part of United Technologies up in Westford through a big boom. Uh, these things have lasting impacts that, that go on not just for days or years, they go on for decades. And I think, you know, we're at a, at a turning point here where if this funding occurs, it could have that same kind of impulse that feeds innovation and employment for decades to come. Very good. I think it's 11.30, I think, which was the end point, official end point. We'll be around, of course, uh, uh, to have some one-on-one -on -one discussions. I'd like to thank our panel and also the dean and Tom for hosting uh, this uh, town meeting. Thank you. Thank you.